comes here is that universal design really started off in a physical realm. All right, first of all, noticing the architecture, paying attention to landscaping, so like the aesthetics, and then the interior spaces, how are those designed to maximize use for a variety of persons. Then it transitioned more to items of use, products. There are things that you are probably using today that you don't even realize that universal design is the leading force before that, before that was created. Think about door handles. How have door handles changed over time? Instead of a knob, it's more of a All right. lever. Instead of a knob, it's now a lever. So hands full, what do we do? We go and we can use something else to open. There's that low physical effort. Um, I don't know if you guys have these in your homes, but we have a pair of scissors that I call them the funky scissors. That's you know the technical term. I think that that's how they're marketed. But they're these scissors that they have one side that you kind of loop your entire hand. It's not just the, the one finger, typical. And then the other side is just a straight bar. Have you seen those types of scissors? All right, they're really neat. I, I always thought, where did these scissors come from? What are they? I've never seen this before. And it's universal design, low physical effort. Um, they're also transitioning to things like measuring spoons, all right, measuring cups. Um, I don't know if you've paid any attention to this or not. Um, I know that um, way back when, when I first got my first apartment, you know, I inherited, you know, the pass me, the hand me down, you know, uh, type uh, supplies, and I had these old, they were orange, hard plastic measuring cups and the numbers on the measuring cups were raised. But there's no real distinction. So people with vision impairments, you're not gonna be able to see that. Well then, they progressed a little bit, and then the plastic wasn't this opaque, heavy plastic. It was thinner, it was more transparent, kind of translucent, and there was the white space on there that had the numbers, one cup, half cup on there. Well now, take a look, next time you're at Target, next time you're at a supermarket, walk through and look at the measuring cups. They're designed universally. They're typically like a dark black, and they're color-coded now. The one cup might be a red circle with very high contrast numbers on there. The next step down might be blue, yellow, green. And that concept stems from this idea of universal design. That was so if you're looking, you don't just have to look for size, you can just say, hey, I know that the one that I need is the red one. So where's the red one in the bin? Grab it and pull it out. And then last but not least, it transitions more or less into the intellectual realm, all right? How can we make information accessible to all people? All right, technology, there's a big boom in our society and our culture for that. How is technology, how does it help make that information accessible to all? And how is that technology in and of itself accessible by a variety of different users? And then it's transitioned to uh, universal design as applied to learning and last but not least, instruction. Now, when it comes to um, universal design for instruction, there's kind of a seminal study that was conducted by the University of Connecticut. On the S drive, I have actually posted the actual study, so if you wanna go through and read about that, uh, you're able to, but what they looked at were these four elements. They thought, okay, we've learned about this idea of universal design. We see how it's bridging over to the idea of learning. Now we want to take it to the next step. How do we as instructors handle this? So the first step was that they started identifying barriers and bridges to academic access from a student perspective. Then they went to the experts in the college field. All right, and ask them questions as related to how do you teach, what methods do you find are most helpful, um, how do you interact with these different types of students. Then they came together, synthesized all this information, and created a framework for universal design for instruction. And then ongoing, they're forging collaborations for implementation. This is probably going to look like um, contacting their IT department um, and that sort of thing. And we'll get into that information um, in a little bit. The first page on your handout, it, the title is something like Faculty Wear. Uh, that is kind of a summation of that study put together by uh, the University of Connecticut. So if you just want to get a brief synopsis, that's the very first page there. 
when we're talking about a student perspective, I have to be honest, this picture makes me laugh every time, every time I look at it. All right, we've got a little bird, a monkey, a penguin, elephant, a goldfish, a seal, a dog, and the instructor. For a fair selection, everybody has to make it or has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. I mean, isn't this a great picture of what it's like to teach at a community college? I mean, think about what that looks like as you're looking out into your class. All right, we have a variety of different intelligences, abilities. All right, people that are more gifted maybe musically, others that are, you know, my learning style, I prefer to see things or I prefer to read things and take notes. All right, how do we design our curriculum, our instruction, so that it provides the best means for those students to climb that tree? I mean, I'm still to this day trying to figure out how that goldfish. I mean, I kind of envisioned him like looking down at the seal being like, hey man, you swallow me and you can get me to the top of the tree, you know? But, you know, they have to figure that out. How am I going to, how am I going to make it? You know, I have to pass this test. How am I going to get there? All right. Um, so the idea here is that individual variability is the norm anymore in our, in our classrooms. It's not the exception. And so keeping that in mind, I think, helps us to make this transition. Now, I don't want to talk extensively about universal design for learning, but I did want to bring it up just because this was kind of the catalyst for universal design for instruction. Uh, I will let you know that universal design for learning, what I've read of it, it's mostly geared towards the K through 12 setting. They're starting to branch out more towards post-secondary education, but pri primarily the focus is on helping students in that K-12 setting uh, reach their goals. So when you're talking about, well, how do I teach to these students, this student group? Well, I have to understand how they learn. So I have to understand how they gather facts, categorize what the student sees, hears, reads. Um, how do they organize and express their ideas? And last but not least, you know, how do I get these learners engaged and motivated? All right? So if you want to read more information on that, the second page, the, the front of the second page is Universal Design for Learning Guidelines. Uh, it's these basic ideas spelled out in more detail. If you want even more detail than that, if you go to the website, cast.org, there's extensive information there. I mean, you can click on it. They have links. You can click on there. They give you ideas. Now, keep in mind, most of it's going to be K through 8 or K through 12 setting. But some of those ideas we can manipulate and use for our classroom purposes. So these nine principles, all right, what you guys actually came here to hear about are these nine principles of instruction. Uh, the idea is that it's a proactive design and use of inclusive instructional strategies. Um, the idea here is we want to benefit the broadest range of learners. So think of that image, you know, that picture with the different animals, right? What does that look like, right? How do we look at our classes and keep all of those different learners in mind? Um, it's more of a framework. Um, they're still developing, implementing, answering questions as related to this, so it's not something that's you know finite, set in stone. Um, but they have done extensive, they being the University of Connecticut, have done extensive research to um, support what they've currently put together. Um, the concept of universal design for instruction operates on the premise that the planning and delivery of instruction as well as the evaluation of learning can incorporate inclusive attributes, all right, without, without compromising academic standards, all right? So there's very much a, a high value placed on um, academic standards. It's just how do we kind of help students get there, 